Hey guys, this is Brother Chris. Hope you're all doing well today. I had had a debate with Sam Shimon on the Trinity a few days ago, and we, uh, we went back and forth, and people really enjoyed the debate. So I got together with him again. Uh, we have a lot in common. We, we've been talking a little bit and helping each other out. And there's a belief Sam has where Jesus Christ still has a flesh body even right now. And that's something I never believed. And I wanted to get with him on that because I believe Jesus Christ is a male spirit seated next to his father in a spiritual body. Sam believes he's still uh, the sa in the same body as he was when he walked the earth. So me and him had a discussion on that. I asked him a few questions and I want to give him a chance to explain what he believes on it. I still believe, uh, even after our discussion, I still believe Jesus Christ has a spiritual body right now. But what's interesting is Sam did make a lot of good points, and make no mistake about it, this guy knows his scripture. This guy knows his scripture like no one I've ever met, and, uh, and I've, I've just never seen anything like it. This guy has scripture committed to memory like, in the Old Testament, New Testament, brackets of scriptures. In my debate with him, I was able to keep up with him. I'm, I still have the same view of, uh, of God that I always had. But I was quoting scripture in my conversation, and he was calling out the numbers. And by halfway through the debate, I realized this guy's like a living computer because I don't even know how to get back to the numbers of the scriptures that are coming out of my mouth. But he's sitting there quoting them. And it was just very impressive, and he has such a gift uh, for apologetics. That's not my primary uh, gift. Just to watch him do that was, was great. So I got, in, I got into it with him on this topic because uh, he likes when I ask him these questions because they're very good questions, and they force him to hone his craft on how to defend this position of that Jesus Christ has a flesh body. So that's how it all played out. And he made a lot of good points, but what's interesting is he caused me to change one of my doctrines, one of my side doctrines, because I oh, I was leaning toward a soul sleep doctrine, and uh, me and my wife would always argue about it because she, you know, she gets mad because she, you know, the way I believe she wouldn't get to go straight to heaven and be with God, she would have to wait for the return of Jesus Christ, and uh, she doesn't even know it yet that I changed my belief because of. Uh, what Sam had brought up, but people say that I won't change my beliefs for anybody. You people are totally wrong. If somebody really knows what they're doing, you know, when you got somebody that really knows the Bible like Sam, I mean, I'm all ears. If he could prove one of my doctrines wrong and he's got the Bible, I'm, I'm going to jump ship. So on the soul sleep doctrine, I'm changing. And now I believe that I'm going to go straight to be with the Lord. So that's good news for me anyway. Um, I know Sam likes it that I'm changing my doctrine. So, uh, you guys could take a look at this. This is a really interesting situation. Does Jesus Christ have a flesh body in heaven? You're going to hear me bringing my objections, and you're going to hear Sam uh, bringing up his point. So, you could decide what you believe. Comment below. Is Jesus Christ still a human being, or is he now a spiritual man? You can comment below and let me know what you think. And even if you have scriptures that you want to bring into this discussion, put them below. This way, uh, both myself and Sam, we can see them and, and we can uh, get better at what we do. So be blessed in Jesus Christ's name, and I hope you enjoy the discussion. Bye-bye. Sam's going to explain to you what he believes about Jesus Christ still being human even now and still being in a flesh body even now. And then I'm going to dialogue with him on this because I don't believe that. I believe Jesus Christ is a man, but not human and not flesh. I believe he's a man with a spiritual form sitting next to the Father right now. In our last debate, Sam made it very clear he believes that when he gets to heaven, he's going to see two, two uh, I'll say individuals, not two beings, but two, two persons that are going to manifest as seated next to each other. Right, Sam? Yeah, so, by the grace of God, that's my belief. And I just want to invoke the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ just to bless this session, anoint this session. 
Fill me with the Spirit to speak truth without error, to recall Scripture and interpret it correctly for the glory of Jesus Christ, and save us from the attacks of the enemy and crucify our flesh in Jesus' name. Be glorified. <clears throat> we beg you, Father, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit. Yes, uh, you were talking about my belief that he's human. I, again, as you explained your position a little more clearly for me, because you said he's a man, but he has a spiritual body. He's not human. Just for, for the record, I want everyone to know I believe that Christ is human, meaning he has a human nature. And part and parcel of that human nature is that he has a physical body of flesh that's now glorified and immortal. In other words, before Jesus was crucified, he had a body of flesh that could be beaten, whipped, even die. It could grow old, feel pain. The difference now is that when that body that was buried was raised, it's now made indestructible. It's immortal. So I do believe he still has a body of flesh because he's tr still human. So when I say man, this is where probably there's going to be some confusion. When I say man, I don't mean, simply mean that he's a male spirit being, a male spirit being. I mean that he's human. He has human nature. He has a physical body of flesh that's immortal and destructible. And I just want to look at a couple of passages, and you let me know when you want me to stop and you want to just – Can know. I just ask you a quick question based yes, on what ahead. you just said? Do you believe he like still eats food and drinks water and – Well, in heaven, I don't know if that would be the case in heaven. In other words, since I'm not in heaven, I don't know whether Jesus in heaven <clears throat> eats food, but I am aware – and again, again, this goes into interpretation of Scripture. See, this is the thing. We're probably going to disagree on how to interpret this. I'm, I'm going to go off a little here and kind of make you explain this thing. I know you like to, because you're an apologist, you're strictly Scripture, but I want to bring this into a more simplistic sure. place for, like, the layman, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that's the thing. I don't know. See, here's the thing. I don't know if the inhabitants of heaven will still need to eat food. I'll give you an example of what I mean. If you go to Exodus 24 and you read 9 to 18, Exodus 24, verses 9 to 18, Moses, who's in a mortal body of flesh that still is prone to sin and decay and die, it says he entered the cloud and remained in God's presence 40 days and 40 nights and didn't eat a single morsel of food or drink water. And that's a body that's corruptible, sinful, and can die. So what I'm trying to say is, even though Jesus has a human nature and a physical body in heaven, that doesn't necessarily mean he needs to eat. Right. But does that mean, does he eat? Well, again, I don't know what takes place in heaven because the Bible is silent on that issue. And this is why I wanted to add the caveat. If we go to Psalm 78, and I'm just going to give the references for people to write down and they can go read on their own because some of these passages are quite lengthy. So let me just give the reference. If you go to Psalm 78 and you read 23 to 29, Psalm 78, 23 to 29, and I want people to cross-reference this as well. Exodus 16, 4 to 8. Exodus 16, verses 4 to, 4 to 8. Exodus 16, verse 15. I'm going to repeat it again. Exodus 16, verse 15. And Exodus 16, 31 to 34. That entire chapter talks about the manna. If you read the context, when God rained down manna from heaven, they called it manna because they didn't know what it was. Because the word manna, if you look at any lexical source, means what is it? Because it wasn't of the earth. Whereas the quail that God brought in through an east wind, they knew what it was. It was quail. It was meat. But they called it manna because it wasn't earthly. So if you go to Psalm 78 and you read 24, 25, but make sure to read 23 to 29 for the context, it says that people ate the grain of heaven, the food of angels. I don't take that metaphorically. I take this to be the food of angels in heaven. And why I don't take it metaphorically is because that manna wasn't earthly. It's manna that comes from heaven. What is it doing in heaven at that time when only spirit creatures dwell in heaven? So the plain reading of Psalm 78, 25 is that angels actually eat food, which is actually confirmed in Genesis 18. If you go to Genesis 18, read the entire chapter. But if you look at the first 14 verses, there Yahweh or Jehovah appears with two angels. They appear as men. It says three men appear. These, these human appearances are so tangible, the text says, that they have feet that can actually be touched and washed. And they ate food. They ate the food that Abraham cooked for them. So here you have angels with Jehovah God assuming human form. They didn't become humans by nature. They didn't become flesh by nature. They manifested in human form. And yet in that human form, they're eating human food. So what do I, what do I get from these passages? Angels eat bread in heaven called manna. And humans can eat their food. 
and angels can eat our food. So does that mean Jesus eats? I don't know. He well, may he be also, eating. Also, John, in, in Revelation, he was he was being fed things that tasted certain ways, and, yeah. you know, that's spiritual food. That's a spiritual taste right there. Yeah, right? exactly. So. exactly. So if you're asking me, as a man with a human body, does he eat? Maybe, maybe not. Does he have to eat? No, because just like God sustained Moses, when Moses, again, I gave the reference, Exodus 24, read 9 to 18. When God sustained Moses in the cloud, where he, be, he beheld the similitude, the form of Yahweh, Jehovah, for 40 days and 40 nights, he did not eat a morsel of food or even drink water, and yet... He was perfectly fine. In fact, I'm sure he came out healthier, stronger, more vibrant than when he went in. Okay, so so, so it's safe. Hopefully that answered your question. I don't know yeah, if it did. Yeah, I'm just going to clarify. I like to break things down more simple. Okay. Can you move over to that one side? One. Yeah, let me, let me see. Hold on. Hold on let me see. Uh, where am I at? Uh, because I was looking at my... Okay, right there. Is that good? Yeah, try and move what one way, like over one way, yeah. Okay, yeah, this way? Like yeah, this? Yeah, 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 right there. Yep, go ahead. Try and stay there so they people right. could see both of us. Um, so it's safe to say your position is he has the flesh body. He's still human right now. But because yes. of his proximity to the Father, likely he doesn't need to eat. Because when Moses was close to God, he didn't need to eat. Now Jesus is even closer to God at his right hand. So you're saying likely that flesh probably doesn't need to eat. But yep. if he does... He eats heavenly food, I'm sure. Yeah, right? it's possible. And when that says right. not so much his proximity to the Father as it is that Jesus also, and I know you believe he's God, but he's not Jehovah, the Father Most High. As God, who has life in him, he can sustain his body without food. So All I don't right. want to just I... give the impression that it's because he's close to the Father. Uh, right. Because even if he was on earth in that glorified body, <clears throat> being being life, having life in him, and being the life. He says that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the resurrection and the life. And in 1 John 1, 2, he said to be the eternal life that was with the Father. Right, but That he, was manifested. He, he can sustain his body in union. This is what I want to make sure. I don't want people to think that I believe Jesus acts independently. He sustains his body as he does all creation in union with the Father and the Spirit. Because you and I both know Colossians 1, 17, and Hebrews 1, 3 says that in Christ, the entire creation subsists, is, consists, is sustained because he sustains all things by his powerful word. Right. Well, he, he also said that the life that he has in him, the Father gave him that life that he has in himself, right? Yeah, but so, at what point was it given to him? Because now we're going to John 5, 26. Well, well because it, yeah. I mean, me and you could go on for years okay. with just that. But my point, my point is... Uh, to me, everything the Son has is because of his proximity to the Father. To me, everything anybody has is because of their proximity, maybe not locational proximity, but spiritual closeness to God, right? So, yeah. Even I mean, that term proximity, I don't know if you're using it spatially, meaning location, because... Well, that's, a, that's what I just said. It, it doesn't necessarily need okay. to be right. yeah, right. geographical. Yeah, in union right? with the Father. All right, yeah, right. because I do believe... The Son and the Father and Spirit are inseparably united to one another so that the Father's life is the Son's life is the Spirit's life. So that's why I'm a Trinitarian in that sense. I don't believe that the Son has life independently from the Father or the Spirit has life independently from the Father. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit all share the same life inseparably, perfectly, eternally. But again, that's that's the Trinity. We can get back to it if but you want me to finish on the humanity. No, right? we're, 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 we're just going to keep it on this topic because I okay. think people are really going to be interested in this. You yeah. Know? Well, if I can look at Revelation 22, 16, why do I believe Jesus is not just a male spirit being? So when I use the term man, I want to make it clear to the audience. I don't mean simply a male spirit figure like Michael is a male spirit figure. Gabriel is a male spirit figure, but that he's human in nature. Revelation twenty two sixteen, and I have a couple, but I'll just take it one at a time. You can ask me to clarify or bring an objection, whatever, as you're led. Uh, Revelation twenty two sixteen, it says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am. So now he's not talking about I was. I am right now from my vantage point of glory in heaven. I am the root, and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. He says right now in heaven, when he communicates to John, and I don't know what you believe about the date of John. Traditionally, it was a sign around 90 AD. Some say before 70. Let's go to 90 AD. 60 years after Jesus' resurrection, he can tell John from heaven, 
I am right now the offspring of David. Well, he cannot be the offspring of David if he's not human and he doesn't have human nature and human lineage. I am the offspring of David right now in heaven. And in Revelation 5.5, 5, same book of Revelation, Revelation 5.5, 5, it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He cannot have any tribal affiliation if he's no longer human. To be of the tribe of Judah, to be the descendant of David while in heaven, assumes a human nature, human ancestry, and therefore he's human by nature, not simply a male spirit being. Now, before I move on to other passages, I don't know if you have questions or comments because I don't want to just keep I mean, giving. Right, right, I, I, I like where you're going with this. I see, I see why you believe what you believe because of this. But I, I would say that he could be that root and just be that person, but in a spiritual body. You understand what I mean? Like you would use it to so defend you, uh, you offspring of David. In the same kind of conversation you would use to explain your Trinity with the way person can split from body. That's how I would use that in that same sense with this situation. You know so what I mean? Yeah, I'm trying to understand what you believe, because you're saying if he's a male spirit body, but you say he's not human, how is he the offspring of David, meaning because, his descendant? Because, he's no longer human, though. Because the consciousness that became flesh, that then ascended and sat next to the Father, is still that person, You under, even though he's in a different form. Does that make sense? It's. It, I'm trying to follow because conscious, being conscious of being human on earth doesn't transfer over to you still having human ancestry because, yeah, I can be conscious that when I was on earth, I was a human being, but that doesn't transfer over into heaven that I'm still human now and I'm still a son of David. Well, he's the that root. was true when I was on earth, but it's not true now in heaven if I'm not human anymore. So I don't see how consciousness would justify him still being a descendant of David in heaven. Consciousness means to me, yeah, on, on earth, I remember I was human. I was the son of Mary and a descent of David through my mother. That was on earth. But now in heaven, I'm not human anymore. I'm a male spirit being, so I'm not an offspring of David, though that's what I was on earth. Right. But he well, is the offspring of David while in his glorified state. You're bringing in the word ancestry, and I realize there may be a real good reason for that. The word Because of the term offspring. Right. Well, the, the word root, right? When he yeah. said that, it, do you think that was properly translated as a root? No, it means that he is the foundation from which David springs forth. Because again, I believe he's more than man. But that's not my emphasis. My emphasis is on the offspring part and the fact that he's of the tribe of Judah. It says he is the lion of the tribe of Judah, not was. And right. that's now one of the elders saying it about him, Revelation 5.5. 5. Right. And in Revelation 22.16, Jesus says, I am not just the root. I am also the offspring. So he, I know that being God, he is the root of David because he's the life of David from which David springs forth. But that wasn't my emphasis. My okay. emphasis is that not just he is the root now, he's still the life of David because apart from Jesus, David can't live. I am now in heaven, his offspring. Having consciousness of being human on earth doesn't transfer over to being still the offspring of David in heaven if he's not human. Okay, I'll... I see where you're going. I got I got no objective to your view of it. Okay, now I wanted to go another passage because I think it, we brought it up, but in in brief, First Timothy two five it says, "For there is one God, there is." So it's not past tense again. Meaning, right now we have one God. When Paul is writing, one meter between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Again, I don't take the word man to mean that he's a male spirit being because Paul is trying to show. Jesus's solidarity and union with the people he mediates for. He mediates for human beings, the men in the passage. And the reason why he's qualified to mediate for human beings is because like them, he's a human being, he's a man, not simply a male spirit being. Because that's a conceptual reading. If you look at it, just let me read it one more time. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Men meaning we humans, who are humans, we have human nature, the man Christ Jesus, and he's affirming the humanity of Christ to show his union with us, his solidarity with us, that he can sympathize with, sympathize with us because he has like nature. He's human like us, not simply a spirit being who's male. Right. So that's another passage that I take to mean that he's human. 
Now, uh, okay, I hear where you're going with that. Obviously, I still believe he's a man, but in a spirit body, so that doesn't contradict what I believe that passage. But I see how you're using it uh, to, to have your position. But I, I would ask, um, when he's up there, like, did he change size? Like, is he, I mean, obviously he was like a five or six foot man, and now he's seated at the right hand of, of the father. Yeah. So if he's just flesh and blood and he's in that same body... Are you saying that the father, like when the father holds him in his bosom, the father's only like a six foot man? Cause no, Jesus, because I, I don't mean, think him. It, Go ahead, I mean, I'm sorry. Jesus is going to come back in the clouds. Every eye is going to see him. Mm -hmm. And it would be kind of hard for every eye on earth to see, you know, some six foot flesh body flying through yeah. the clouds. Like, have you thought about all those aspects? Yeah, I've thought about it. Yeah, because it, it, again, number one, when it says the same body, I want to make it clear. By the same body, meaning the body that was nailed and buried, that came to life, but it's now glorified, transformed that it's immortal and destructible. So that's what we call the spiritual or glorious body. So it's not simply that body that he took from Mary that was weak, could grow old, get tired, be beaten and killed. That body now is made glorious. It's transformed. It's immortal. It's indestructible. But now going back to what you're saying, you're saying that he's in the bosom of the Father. Again, Unless you take it literally, he's in the bosom of the Father. Even by your understanding of a spirit body, that spirit body must be small enough to literally fit in the Father's bosom. So I don't think you take it literally, right? You Not, take it no, as a metaphor? No, no, well, that's the super literal, that it's in the bosom. Like if I'm yeah. holding uh, my wife in my bosom, she's in. I'm, I'm holding her to my chest. Yeah, okay, I'm, but I, so... I would, I would never say my wife is living inside my, my chest, you know? Yeah, because I mean? the passage that you're referring to, this is why I got confused, you're referring to John one eighteen, where it says he's in the bosom of the Father. It well, doesn't say he's at the bosom of the Father. Yeah, but so, I mean, I don't think anyone re would read that and, and... Precisely. So to give me that as an objection doesn't really refute well, anything, an because objection. Jesus is not literally... Well, as, an, an, as a question, what I'm trying to say, Jesus is not literally in the bosom of the Father. That's metaphorical language to mean that Jesus holds the closest, dearest, nearest position to the Father's quote-unquote heart. That's all it means. Because if we take it to mean that he's in the bosom of the Father in a literal sense, which you're not, but then we have a problem in John 17. I'm somewhere 24. in the middle. I believe the father actually hugs his son in heaven. Absolutely. Well, why, yeah. if I'm six foot, let's just go to the argument. If I have, I'm six foot and then I have a twin brother who's six foot, I can hold him by the head and gently push his head to my chest, to my bosom. What would, why would that be a problem then, even in your argument? Well, my, my point is, if you believe Jesus is still a human being, even today, and, and he's got the same body, he would have to be about our size, and I think God is way, way bigger than us. So for him to interact yeah. with his son would be like him interacting with an ant, like a midget, you know? Well, that's that's assuming that the form that God has in heaven is a humongous, giant, giant body, whereas if I read the way God is described in but, Revelation but, but, 4 but, and but, Isaiah 6, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, but if his hand laid the foundation of the earth, I mean, come on. He's big. Yeah, see, but it, it, we're having problems with metaphors again. Well, we're always going to Is it literally have his it. hand, or <laughs> is the hand a metaphor for power? Because when I think of hand, what do I do with my hand? I can resist, I can lift, I can strike. So hand becomes, in biblical understanding, a metaphor for power and strength. By his power, he laid the foundation there. That's why in other passages it says, by his wisdom, understanding, and power, he created all things. Well, that's So why this is where I'm getting confused here. You're taking a passage— which is obviously metaphorical, but you're saying it's obviously literal. It's an actual hand. Well, it's obviously metaphorical to you. But how many hands created them? Because it says that the heavens are the works of the Son's hands. So is it the hands of the Father or the hands of the Son Both. or the hands of the Spirit? That's now six sets of hands that created the heavens, according to you. Or three sets of hands, I'm sorry. Three sets of hands that created. I, so whose hands actually did the creating? I believe, well, the Holy Spirit I would knock out. I would object to you bringing him into the hand party. But, but he's the one who created. He, mo he moved, but he's invisible. So there's no, I mean, he can take shape like we discussed last time if he would, yes. if he'd like to. And that's like but, Father God is invisible, but can take on a shape. And the Son is invisible, can take on a shape. So look, I believe, I believe when said, let us make man in our, in our image and in our likeness, he turned to his right hand to his son. And he was discussing this with his son and doing all this as a gift to his son. 
So, you know, I, yeah, I agree yeah. that the son is included, but in the context, he's speaking to the spirit. But even we go with that, because that was a point I didn't get to last time. Maybe that's one of those things that you probably thought I was avoiding. I was going to ask you, if you take that image to be a physical image or that God has a spiritual body and our physical bodies are molded after that spiritual body, then that proves too much because it proves that God must have male and female genitalia because it says both the man and the woman are created in God's image. I, so I, are you saying the father's spiritual body has both male and female genitalia? I know if you go to Genesis, you're going to go into the original language and try and prove that when God said, let us make man in our image, he meant Adam and Eve. But I that's what the, Well, that's what the context I, says. I, but I disagree with you on that point. I believe oh. only Adam was made in his image, and he but, just added Eve at, into the Yeah, Chris, I, uh, I'm not trying to debate honestly. You know me now. I don't see you as an opponent. Of the, uh, but no, if you read just Genesis 1, 26, the Adam there is the them, the male and female. Eve is automatically included. And in Genesis 5, 2, she's even said to be Adam. She's called Adam. Can I read those passages yeah, you for you? Could, you could read it, yeah. I know, I know, I know. I've heard this argument. I still don't believe that he was including Eve in it, but you can, you can go ahead and take. Yeah, let me, let me first go to Genesis five one or two. Let me look at it. This is the book of the generations of Adam and the day that God created man. And if you go to Hebrew, it's Adam, but that doesn't matter. Uh, in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them. And blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Now that's called not, that, their name Adam. But that's not in in the, our English text, right? No, it is. It's in the King James. Called their name Adam. I'm using the King James. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's in Genesis 5 too, the King James. In fact, other translations say mankind, humankind. King James actually retains Adam and says, and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when he, they were created. And then if you go to Genesis 1, 26 to 27, right there, if you read it clearly, the male and the female together make up Adam, and the male and the female together are created in God's image. Here, God said, and that's, by the way, why he speaks in the plural. If you go prior to Genesis 1, 26, 27, in every other creative act, God simply says, let there be. But when it comes to mankind, he changes his language and speaks of himself, creating mankind using plural pronouns to discuss his creation of man. Let us make man in our image because the man that he creates will reflect the fact that God is a community of persons of like nature, like Adam is a community of persons of like nature. That's why he even changes the language. But let me read it to you so I can make my case. Genesis 1, 26 to 27. And God said, let us make man. And if you go to the Hebrew, it's Adam, but doesn't matter. But it is Adam. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them, right there he's telling you that this man is a them. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the earth and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female he created them. The him, that's Adam, is the male and female that makes up the them. And that's again why I said this passage isn't saying just the male, male and female make up the one Adam. That one Adam can be described as a him and a them because that Adam is a plurality and unity as a reflection of the God who created Adam well, is a plurality and unity. A com, a, 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 the word is not, I was going to say, a community of persons of like essence. Like Adam is a community of like persons of like essence. Right. So all this... So, all this, right, and uh, and that's very... So that's what I'm saying about the spirit body. Does God not have female genitalia, per your interpretation? No, no, no. no. Does he have I... male genitalia, then? Let's go with the male. If he created the male in his image, the no, male, no. that physical body, resembles no, no. the spiritual body. There is no... In, in my firm opinion, there is no genitalia of either sex on, on any spirit beings, because the Bible says we're not going to need them, because we don't marry... In heaven, we and and will be as the angels. So then, how can male and female both be in the image of God when obviously physically their physical likeness, likeness differs? It's not identical it's because the, it's your, because if you go into the Greek, that word image is the outward similitude, outward similitude meaning the face, the yeah, hand. Yeah, you mean the Hebrew, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm sorry. Yeah, but yeah. yeah, but the outward similitude doesn't mean 
He's the outward similitude of God's form. It means that he will image in visible form God's characteristics and qualities and authority. Mm -hmm. I don't disagree that image means the, the male and the female are going to image God in a visible manner. What is invisible becomes visible in them in that God's moral nature and dominion will now be imaged visibly in Adam and Eve. That's what it's saying. I, I mean, I can back that up from even Paul's interpretation of image, how Paul interprets image. But even, yeah, but just, Paul, you can interpret image all different ways all over the Bible. And because you're a human encyclopedia, you could go anywhere. But I want to stay in the in, in there. Okay, sure, but let me so, just read Paul, these two patches from Paul. I'm not disagreeing with you, but let me just read what Paul says. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. We'll go back to Jesus, the, the man. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Lie not one another. And the entire passage is Paul exhorting Christians to moral purity. Okay? Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So clearly, for Paul, being renewed after the image of God is not something visible in the sense that God has a spiritual body and my physical body resembles it, it's something moral. That I image God's moral nature <clears throat> visibly for all to see. And this is confirmed in Ephesians 4.24. Ephesians 4.24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So I don't disagree. Image means something visible. But what is visible? I am imaging God's moral nature and his authority visibly, because God is invisible by nature, his moral nature is invisible to us, so we image that visibly for others to see. That's all it's saying. Well, I mean, you would know the Hebrew better than me. What is the word there for image, and does it not mean outward uh, similitude? It's, I believe it's salam. I can look at the lexicon. Salam is one of them, and then the other word, I have to look it up, but yeah, that's what I'm saying, though. Even that salam doesn't mean... God is visible. It means you are making visible what is invisible in God. That's well, my that's, point. That's what I'm all saying. Right. I, all right. I see how you view it. I still think it's because we have eyes, ma a mouth like God, hands, and a body okay. like him. But that, okay. that, that would bring me to another uh, question. Sure. Do you think Jesus still has a genitalia in heaven? Well, if, he's, if he is man and he is the first fruits of the resurrection— meaning that we also will be raised with physical bodies like him, the difference is he's a male human being, then that means when I'm raised, unless the text suggests otherwise, I'm assuming I'm going to also have genitalia. But again, I can be wrong. Maybe when I am raised, because I won't need to procreate, I won't have those bodies. I don't know. Right. I mean, he, I, the Bible I, mean, doesn't I, tell us. I mean, I know this is kind of interesting conversation, and it's not in the text, but... He would basically have to have testicles that don't work, right? Like he, Well, I mean, see, again, you're asking me, so the Bible doesn't go into that depth with telling me, are those things required for a post-resurrected physical body? Well, I don't know, because when I'm raised as a physical body, and I'll show that I believe that we will be raised with physical bodies that are glorified, will it be identical in every way? Because I did say that the body that Jesus was buried with, when it came out, there are differences in the sense that it's glorified, immortal, indestructible, which wasn't true of that body before it was raised. Right. Now, could it be also that when he's raised, the genitalia won't be necessary? And again, I want to apologize to people that we're having to use the language, but they're, they're mature enough to understand we have to go into these issues. Right. I really don't know because I don't know when I'm raised as a male human being with a glorified physical body, will then the genitalia be removed? I don't know, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm the Bible simply, does, it's silent on that. I'm simply bringing this up so, like, you know, people that are watching this can consider all these things when they make their choice about what they believe. Now, I yeah, uh, but just let me add one more point to that. Even if he had genitalia, it's not that they're useless any more than when Paul says he's been given the gift of celibacy, or when Jesus says in Matthew 19:10 to 12, some people make themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. So. To say that, well, he have testicles, and I know you didn't mean it irreverently because we love and worship and honor Jesus Christ, that are not being used. Well, there are people here in these bodies of flesh that because they love Jesus more than their flesh, don't use their genitalia, but they die to that desire as a sacrifice for the kingdom. So that right, still wouldn't right. be a problem. 
I, I hear you. I think it's not in the context of what we're talking about, but it does yeah. it does add on to what we're talking about for sure. But um, I like your questions. I like them. Uh, I got a lot of them. This is going to get good. <laughs> All have, right, hopefully. Look, we both like to go off on trails because we like to, to talk, you know, and it's fun, but let's yeah. keep it. Well, I'm going to keep it on the flesh thing because I know okay. both, bo both. But you've got my point of First Timothy 2.5 that the reason why I say man there isn't simply a male spirit body is because it's being used in the same context where Paul mentions the men that Jesus mediates for. These men are human beings with human nature. And Jesus mediates for them because he's in solidarity with them. He's one with them because he's of like nature. So I don't take right. it to meet man simply as a male spirit body so or your, male spirit person. Your point is his medi his, the, his position as a mediator is more genuine because he's just like us still even now. That's what you're trying to say. Yeah, well, the, Paul is saying that we have a mediator who is like us in that he's human. He has our nature and can well, sympathize he, with he us. That's Paul's point. He didn't say human. He said man. Well, he didn't say human in that first part, but he said men. Would you deny they're human? Well, no. He no. says men. But um, a, a, a man doesn't necessarily need to be a physical human. A no, man, but that, you know. that wasn't my point. I said in the context, the use of men here means human beings, and you know it also means women. So even the term men here means males and females who are human in nature. And then he mentions you males and females who are human. You have a mediator who is like you, human, Jesus Christ. Right. I, I That's hear you. my argument contextually. I didn't right. say man in of itself has to prove that he's human. Uh, there are angels who are called men, and they're not right. human by nature. The Father himself is said to be a man in John, and he's not human by nature. I'm arguing it's con context, the contextual right. use. You humans, you men, male and female, you got a mediator who's like you, a human who mediates. Now, now through watching your stuff, I've seen yes. that I've seen that you take uh, this position and you kind of amalgamate it with the Trinity because it, it, it helps you reconcile something like I would attack in my position that Jesus has a God in Revelation still today. And, yep, and exactly, you, then yeah. you go back and you break back and you say God is the God of all flesh and you yep. bring you bring it all together and I understand how you're packaging this thing. But the, my problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Sam. I just have love to you too, man. Yeah. My problem with it is Numbers twenty three says God is not a man, and that he's you, lie. right that he's right, but he's not a man that he should lie and do a lot of other things that men. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a blanket statement. He's not a man. I know yeah. you're. Gonna, I know you're going to take that, but just that he should lie and smash it together and try. No, and I, I'm going to say that uh, the way we're reading scripture, you got a contradiction because the same Moses says in Exodus 15:3, oh. Jehovah's a man of war. This is why I love you. You just you'll go anywhere. Yeah, because you're down. quoting Moses, who says God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should repenteth. But man, in Exodus 15:3, I guess Moses forgot because he says in Exodus 15:3, the Lord Jehovah is a man of war. Right. The Lord is his name. So now, Moses, is God a man or is he not a man? Can you make up your mind? He is not, He. He is and isn't. Now, this supports my position because oh. I say Jesus is a man, but he's a spiritual man. And I've say, even said in our last debate that a man can be both human or spiritual. So this okay. would actually support my position. That okay, but now notice times. what you did. You first quoted Numbers 23 to show God is not a man. Right. And, uh, but then when I quote a passage where Jehovah is a man, then you said, well, yeah, he's a man in this sense, which then opens the door for my explanation. Right, right, right. But when we have some, when we have them saying he is a man in one sense and he's not yes. a man in another sense, then we could understand that. We could use the term man to indicate human being, male, or yeah. we could use the term man to indicate male in heaven with the spirit body because I'll tell you right now. I don't believe Jesus Christ has a genitalia, and I don't believe he's six foot tall. I, really, I don't know how tall he was when he was on earth, so I don't know. Yeah, I'm just giving, I'm, I'm giving an estimate. I don't <laughs> I don't believe he's anywhere near the size that we are right now, sitting next to the Father. I believe when he ascended, and we both know that when he resurrected, his body appeared different. Their eyes were kind of blinded from recognizing him at a point. Yeah. Things seemed different. He seemed to vanish, and I'm going to ask you why... I'm yeah, well, the vanishing part is doesn't prove he doesn't have a physical body no, any more no, than no. in Acts eight thirty nine when Philip vanished I'm not from the Ethiopian eunuch. 
I'm because not, you said he vanished. I know, but I'm not implying because uh, we're going to go into that. I'm going to ask you if you think he literally yeah. vanished or he just left quickly. I'm going to ask. No, you about I, that. I believe he literally vanished, just like yeah. Philip literally vanished. But Philip still right. had a body of flesh. Acts eight thirty nine. Right. right. Okay, so you believe he literally vanished? Yeah, just like because again. God can take a physical body and make it disappear from one place and make it appear in another place. That's why I keep saying Acts 839. Philip vanished from the sight of the Ethiopian eunuch, but you wouldn't deny that Philip had a body of flesh that was mortal and sinful. Right, right. And that's why I wanted just to ask you Jesus about it. Just because Jesus vanished, you know, that doesn't, it doesn't have a body of flesh, right? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you your opinion. And I agree with what you just said, but... You know, we used to be at like beer drinking parties and everyone would be drunk and somebody would leave the party without saying goodbye and everyone would say, man, he vanished. Yeah, so, yeah, well, yeah but I do take it that he just disappeared, just right. like Philip disappeared. But my point in Acts 839, Philip disappearing no more proves that he didn't have a body of flesh than Jesus disappearing instantaneous proves his body wasn't fleshly. That doesn't prove the point that his body was spiritual in the sense that it's not physical, it's not human. So I have no problem with that. Now, if you want to go there, if you want me to explain Numbers 23 19 more in depth, that's fine. Or if you want me to go with that, that's fine. I'm going to let you show me because I have more to say on Numbers 23 19, but it's up to you. Do you feel led to do it? Because I'll let no, you I, I, because I wanted people to see that it's when you kept saying that I'm strict to the context, strict to the context. I thank you for that. I take it as a compliment. Because I am very fully aware, a person can, I'm not saying you, a person can take any verse to make it say anything, but then, like in this case, we take one verse, God is not a man, another verse that says he is, and we created a contradiction when no contradiction exists, provided we understand what these words mean in their context. Now, you said the Lord is a man of war here, agrees with you that he's a spiritual male being, a spiritual male body, but in Exodus 15, 3, he's not talking about the Lord being a spiritual male figure, it's comparing him to a human being, a warrior in the battlefield. The Lord is a man of war. Mm -hmm. It's talking about men who are known to be warriors who fight and kill and slay and subjugate. But, he, but he's obviously not a, a, a yes, man of and war. So, but that's my point. What I'm trying to get at is when you're dealing with Numbers 23 and 19, it's saying God is not a man in this sense. He's not a man who can lie, nor a son of man who changes his mind. Human beings are imperfect by nature. They're duplicitous. They're double-minded. God is not like that. So that means if God does become a man, then he wouldn't be that kind of man. And that's exactly the kind of man that Jesus wasn't. When Jesus became man, he didn't lie. He wasn't double-minded. So this passage is not telling us whether God can be a man or can't be a man. Mm -hmm. Because it's true. You and I both agree. At this moment in salvation history, when Moses wrote this, there was no incarnation. Jesus did not become flesh. And God by nature is spirit. And so God is unlike fallen man in that fallen humans are liars, duplicitous, complicit, double-minded. God is unlike that. So now the question remains open. Can God become human by nature? And if he does become human, would he be like other humans who are sinful? No. And lo and behold, that's exactly what we find in Jesus. Although he became a man, he was a human being, he wasn't a liar, he wasn't duplicitous, he wasn't double-minded, he was a perfect man. So I don't see a problem with Numbers 23, 19 and Jesus being a man still in heaven. Mm -hmm. I obviously still do, because it says God is not a man, and that's just... Well, at that time, there was no incarnation. Of course he's not a man. You agree, right? Yeah, but if you believe Jesus is God, then he's not a man. No, we're talking about at that time of Moses, God wasn't a man, because though you believe Jesus is in Jehovah, you still believe he's God. And hold so on, are you saying on, that Jesus is God, me. couldn't you, become man, but he became man, even according to your view? You lost me on this one. I'm, I'm Look, okay, you don't believe, we got we gathered, that you believe Jehovah is the name of the Father, the yeah. Father is most high, because he has authority over the Son, though the Son mm -hmm. came out of the Father. But still, you believe in some sense Jesus is God, don't you? I believe he's my God in the sense that he's been given all authority in heaven. Yeah, and I, and I don't, I'm not agreeing. I'm arguing with you. What I'm saying, he's still God. So that if I take this passage, you got a problem but because not, you still believe your God became man. No, according to this passage, he couldn't. Right. And and, and we both know, and like you said, it's because he didn't incarnate yet, right? So, yeah. So, so that's why I'm saying this passage right, now, has to be understood in its historical context. Yeah. It's not saying he can't be this. At the time when Moses wrote it, he wasn't this. Amen, Moses. 
But does that mean he can't be human later? No, I'm not saying that. All right, Moses. Okay, we okay. Yep. So let, let me go to John chapter 4. I'm going to read it to you. It says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So God is a spirit. You say Jesus is the most high God. Yep. So then we have in Luke 24 that says, uh, a spirit hath not flesh and blood, hath not flesh and bones, right? So yeah, if, if, yeah. God, if God is a spirit, right, Sam? Yeah. Yep. And Luke says a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones, and you say mm -hmm. Jesus is God, what do you yeah. do with that one? Oh, that's very easy, but I'm laughing because you know you quoted a passage that shows that Jesus, after his res resurrection, has a body of flesh and bones, right? Well, I believe that. I believe but wait. I believe when Jesus after resurrection, I showed him and he said, because Luke 24, 39, which you referred to, Jesus say, handle me and see. Right, right. That I is I. No, no. I be let me clarify my position. I believe yeah. that that flesh body resurrected as a flesh body. I and believe, what happened? I believe that the father quickened him, like the Bible says, and resurrected him. And when he did resurrect, he was he was definitely empowered by the Holy Ghost, that flesh body. And so much so that he almost appeared even differently to his disciples. And then when he ascended onto the Father, and he cro and he crossed the veil into the third heaven, that's when he transfigured into a spiritual state. Okay. Well, okay. okay we're gonna then that means the onus is on you to show that happened. But let me answer your question here. In John four twenty four, you say God is a spirit. But you and I, you know, I like context, right? Let's read twenty three to twenty four. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. In the context, it's talking about God the Father is a spirit. And you must worship God the Father in spirit and truth. Now, going back to your question. Even though a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as we see Jesus have, you and I both know that human beings still have a spirit residing in their bodies, right? Yes. Okay, so here it's talking about the Father being spirit, and there it's talking about Jesus is more than a spirit. He's a spirit inhabiting a body of flesh and bones. Where is the problem with Jesus, who is God who became flesh, and yet the Father didn't become flesh, so the Father is purely spirit. In other words, the Father has one nature. He's spirit. That's the context. Right, right. Here. I think, I think the, the problem here is the way I view that verse because of my view of God. I view it differently than you view it. Anywhere I see the word God, period, yes. I, that to me is the most high God. When you see that word God, you can slice and dice it to mean the Father or the Son because you're a Trinitarian. Well, no, I'm going so, by the context where it says it's the Father, right? Right. So it's not I'm slicing and dicing it. I'm just looking at the verse before. The God what? who is said to be spirit here is the Father. Yes, the Father did not incarnate. The Father has but one nature, a divine nature that is spirit. He is spirit. But that doesn't tell me whether Jesus Christ, who is God, can have a body of flesh and bones that his spirit inhabits. You're right. It's two different contexts. Here it's not about the Father. The Father is spirit. There Jesus is trying to show... I'm more than a spirit. He's not saying he's right. not a spirit. But he's saying someone that's just a spirit, no more, no less, doesn't have a body of flesh and bones. But I'm more than that. I'm a spirit that's embodied in flesh. Right, right. Body but, of flesh and but Sam, the problem with that is you believe when he ascended, he became one being with the Father. He was always one being with the Father. But being means the common essence they share. Because I don't know how you're describing being. To me, being means the essence that the Son and the Father and Spirit possess in common fully and completely, so that Jesus I, is one being, meaning he is fully God. The nature of God is the nature of the Son and the nature of the Spirit. But Jesus can then take on the nature of human without this affecting his divine nature or affecting the Father's divine nature. Right. I don't see the—what's oh, well, the problem there? Because I don't believe that's the definition of being. Maybe you could pull it up on your thing because so I don't have to take down the— Being camera. means existence, right? Do you have a dictionary on your thing? Well, I mean, I mean, dictionaries. I don't know. I mean, what dictionary? I mean, do you want me to read? Do I find one? I mean, on, I mean, on. dictionaries we're... are human, obviously, but I don't know. Here, let's go. Let's go to dictionary.com. Let's see this. Let's put yeah. on the word being. Let's see how many definition entries there are. Okay, let's see. I'm going to dictionary. That's all I have now because I'm on the internet and I have my books with me. Okay, let's see being. All right. <clears throat> let's check it out. The fact of existing, existence. Yep. As opposed to non-existence. Well, that's Conscious, not, yeah. mortal existence life, right? Substance yeah. or nature, exactly. So I went to the dictionary.com, 
Let me give you the definition, dictionary.com, mm -hmm. the fact of existing, yeah, existence, as opposed to non-existence, conscious, but then it says mortal existence, and you wouldn't apply that definition to God, mortal existence, meaning human existence, life, mm -hmm. substance or nature, something that exists, a living thing, exactly, mm -hmm. the thing, exactly, the, the, the substance is, or nature, but the, the issue existence, is, right, go ahead, yeah. right, anybody who says the word they're a being, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to convert that to a living individual in their mind. If I said, like, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, go ahead. If, 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 I, if I said there's a person over there, but there were two beings standing next to them, yeah. that would be individual angels or people or something. Individuals, no? Yeah. So yeah. If, 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 yeah. If, go ahead. I'll let you finish your point. I'm sorry. If, I'm not trying to cut you off. If Jesus Christ ascended to the Father and became one in being with him. He was always one in being with him. That's the problem. He's saying became one. He was already one with him on earth. He couldn't have been one being because the Father didn't incarnate. You don't need to incarnate to be one being, meaning having the same substance and nature of the Father. Just one of the definitions here, right? I mean, just you, you asked me to go to the dictionary. Let me read it. Substance or nature. He can be one in being with the Father if you define being to mean substance or nature because he shares the same nature of the Father but then took on additional nature of humanity that the Father didn't. Yes, he can. Why can't he? Mm -hmm. I, I have no answer for you. I'm no, but coming back to when you went with the two beings and two angels. Now, here's again what I had a problem, and I mentioned this last time. And you know this. You, you love the Bible. You love God. You know, and that's why I, I enjoy talking with you because I don't, like I said, I don't consider you a heretic. I don't. People want to stone me. That's fine. You know, I love you as my brother. And you believe in the Bible. But you do believe the Bible when it says that God is unlike anything in creation. You can't liken him to anything. He's beyond our understanding. But for your argument to work, notice you're analogizing it. This is the analogy you gave me. If I see two beings, two angels, then they're two separate beings, two separate persons. Yeah, that is true of creatures who are limited, who are temporal, who are finite. But why does that automatically transfer to God who is infinitely greater than us and his existence is infinitely more complex than ours? Why does that have to be automatically true of God? Because the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all their ways, and if he's triple-minded, you got to put him in a loony bin. But that's a man, because a man is not created to have more than one mind. See, again, but, you took a, what is a case of man. Yeah, man can't have more than one but mind. We, yeah, but well, now we're back to man, and, you, and your position is that, and we're, both of our positions is that Jesus is a man. Sure, but again, so, why would he have to be double-minded? Because it's that one single person... Who has two natures? Why would there have to be him somehow be double-minded where he's confused like a double-minded man? Because double-minded there means a man who's confused, a man who's inconsistent, a man who changes his mind. And we'd expect that of men who are fallen, who are inconsistent, capricious, duplicitous, and don't know all the facts. So a man can say, this is what I'm going to do. But when something arises, he changes his mind because he's double-minded. That's talking about the fallen nature of a human being. But why would that transfer over to a perfect being with a perfect mind? And why would that automatically mean that Jesus, as a man, would struggle with being double-minded? I, I don't see the correlation again. It, it, it just means, I mean, it's clear Jesus has a separate will. He said, I, I've not come to do my own will, but the will of the Father. He wanted. Well, even, yeah, we're going yeah. back to the Trinity, because yeah. I don't believe Jesus is the same person as the Father. So all you're yeah. proving is different wills means they're different persons. But it doesn't mean they don't possess the same nature in common. That's my mm -hmm. whole argument. The nature is the same, but the persons are different. They're not the same person. Can, can I tell you, uh, can I read some scriptures that make me not, not believe it? Not believe yeah, it? please, uh, engage me, man. I don't mind. That's why I'm here. All right, 1 Corinthians uh, 43 to 49. You mean 1 Corinthians 15, 43, 49? Yeah, that's what I have here. Yeah, I was going to go to this. It yeah. is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Is that the one? You're going to start in 40, uh, 43. He said 43 for me, so I don't know. You want me to start 43? Yeah, that's what I have here. Okay, so in here I'm reading King James again. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening. In other words, life-giving spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. 
as is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall bo bear, I'm sorry, the image of the heavenly. All right. What, what is your point here? Because you, you want me to interact with it or you want me to? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know why I would believe take this to believe that he was raised a quickening spirit. Yeah, well, Jesus is a quickening spirit because he has two natures. As God, he's spirit who gives life, but he's man. Because if you're going to be consistent, I want you to read 45 carefully again. I want you to catch this, King James. And the Greek word is soul. I'm not trying to impress you with the Greek, but it's suke, uh, suke, suke, if you want to pronounce it. At, and so does when the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. You would no more deny that Adam had a body of flesh, even though he's said to be a living soul. <clears throat> so then why would I necessarily assume that if Jesus is a quickening spirit, that means somehow he's a quickening spirit but doesn't have a body of flesh, when Adam was a living soul that inhabited a body of flesh? because It says he's a living soul. Because when it's raised in incorruption, they say it's raised a spiritual body. But that's the question. What does it mean, spiritual body? It means, does it mean it, a body that's not a flesh or a body that's to, under the power and dominion of the spirit? To me, it obviously means a body that's not flesh. That's why I believe he does, he's not in flesh, you know? All right, well, I'm going to show you how Paul uses the term spiritual. Let me show you an example. You tell me you, if but, this means but, these people had no flesh bodies. Galatians 6.1. Galatians mm -hmm. 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault... Ye which are spiritual, it's the same word. Yeah, Ye but, which are spiritual. Yeah, but in this context, he's not contrasting it to a natural body. No, so what I'm saying we, is, we really these people know. are said to be spiritual. Because notice what your argument is, Chris. Your argument is it's said to be a spiritual body, right? Yeah. Okay, so you're saying because it's called spiritual, it's not fleshly. Well, if that's the case, then these people are called spiritual. That means they don't have bodies of flesh, right? No, but it's raised a spiritual body. But that's my whole point. Because it's called a spiritual body, no more proves it's not a body of flesh than these Christians who are no longer natural or carnal, but are spiritual means they don't have a body of flesh. You're assuming the word spiritual means that they don't have, or the resurrected body is not a body of flesh. I but just, that's not... I, I just don't think it's in the context of like a resurrection metamorph metamorphosis. Do you understand what I mean? I don't think when you're going... There is the a metamorphosis. This is where we're, again, confusing. There is a metamor The metamorphosis is not that it's a body of flesh and now it's longer body of flesh. The metamorphosis is that it's a body that's under the dominion of sin. It's natural. It's corruptible. It's sinful. It dies. Now that body is no longer under the dominion of sin. It doesn't die. It's indestructible. But it's not a body that's not flesh. It's a body that's been transformed, metamorphosized, into a body that's indestructible, immortal, no longer under the control, influence of Satan or demons. That's all it means. Okay. Why would it have to mean a body devoid of flesh? Because it says it's To me, a spiritual body is not a flesh body. To me, a spiritual body is a body that's not under the dominion, influence, control of yeah. sin, Satan, or death. I mean, I don't, I don't believe, I don't believe right now I have a spiritual body. I, ha I believe I have a spirit in a physical body. Yeah, because like, your body is going to die. But when this right. body dies and it's raised, it says it right here in forty-two. So also the resurrection of the dead, it is sown in corruption. That's what it means. It is raised in incorruption. That's the point. This body mm -hmm. you have is corrupt. It, it's prone to sin, demonization, you name it, it's going to die. But when it's raised, it's incorruptible. It will no longer be possessed of demons or no longer struggle with sinful inclinations. It will no longer corrupt itself because it's incorruptible, because it's spiritual, under the dominion, control, power of the spirit. That's all it means. How do you, um, how would you view the transfiguration? Uh, if you go in the Greek, it's to metamorphosize when he transfigured. Yeah. How would you explain that? I would explain that it proves my point because he still had his body of flesh. That was his body there that now <clears throat> radiated with that glorious divine light that was veiled by his body. But his body wasn't discarded. So, so why should it be discarded in heaven? So in like just to be specific, in what way did he metamorphosize exactly right there? In your Means, opinion, I know you can't explain it because no one can. But No, what I'm yeah, yeah. my point is the text is clear. He started radiating, he appeared his clothes appeared whiter than any, I forget the term that Luke uses, 
uh, anyway, any could could make it white, and he shined with the brightness of the sun. It means the radiation of his glory. He was radiating with that divine glory. That glory, glory was now radiating through his physical body that had been veiled. That's all it's saying. I find, I mean, that to me isn't a full metamorphosis. It's just the glory of God shining through the same body. But that's what it says in the text. It says that's, it that does, explains no. what the metamorphosis, uh, metamorphosis is. He transfigured. How? His face shone like the sun, and his white was whiter than anything on earth. It says it. It explains right, it what the metamorphosis is. No, no, but it says both. It says both. You know, so. But it explains the method of the transfiguration. He started radiating. Right. And if radiating with this glorious, luminous <clears throat> brilliance and beauty means he didn't have a body of flesh, then if you go to Exodus 34, Moses radiated with the light of Jehovah so much so that they couldn't look upon him, but he still had a body of flesh, and his body of flesh was corruptible. Okay. This is, this is interesting stuff. But that's um, Exodus 34. I'm not making it up. It's there, right? No, no. It's... Everything you say is there. I don't. I trust. So if you, you go say, there, Moses still had a body of corruptible <laughs> flesh, but because he was in the presence of God, he now started radiating the glory of God, the light of God, through that body of flesh that was corruptible, to the extent that the Israelites had to hide their faces from Moses, and he had to put a veil. But right. he still had a body of flesh. Why would it have to change for Jesus? Well, over here, it's it's specifically called the transfiguration. With Mo yeah. with Moses, it isn't so. Yeah, but, but my point is the transfiguration is explained by the radiance that manifested through the physical well, body. It doesn't have to discard a physical body for that transfiguration the, to take place. The, the way I view it is the radiance is taking place because a metamorphosis already took place. It's a little okay. different. Okay. It's, it's a little different than the way you view it. I'm glad I got a chance to clarify that because right. your your view of it is valid. It's not an insane view of it. It's very logical. Let right. me let let me uh. Let me bring up another point that makes me question this whole thing. Okay. Obviously, as you know, Jesus Christ, you said in your teaching that I saw on the internet that um, Jesus Christ, we don't realize what he did for us because now he's trapped in a flesh body forever because heaven went bankrupt and he was once rich. And yeah, those are, you're putting it in your way, right? Well, are you, you explain it. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no. I, yeah, because you said heaven was bankrupt and trapped. What I said was, Jesus, knowing the condescension and the price it would take for him to save us, that he would take a physical body that would be bound to time, space, and place, so that in some sense, because of his human nature, his physical body, he is bound to time, space, and place. But remember, I do believe he's the God-man. So as God, he transcends his physical body, oversees creation, and sustains it in union with the Father and the Spirit. Okay. But prior to taking on that body, he had no such limitation. In other words... Before he became flesh, he wasn't. He didn't have an aspect of him that bound him to time, space, and place. But when he truly became human and was born as a babe and born as a human being and adding that human nature, he now experienced something that he hadn't experienced prior to that, taking on a physical body that is now bound to time, space, and place. So there's a sense in which Jesus is bound to time, space, and place. But because he's also God, he transcends even his body, time, space, and place, oversees all things, sustains all things with the Father and the Spirit. That's my position. Well, if he's, he, you believe the Son is still omnipresent, but you're saying you only believe that because he's attached to God. Well, I don't know when you say attached to God. Father, Son, and Spirit together omnipresent in that the entire creation are present before them. They oversee every part of creation and sustain every part of creation. By their powerful word. So, so that's what you mean, yeah. So in a sense, Jesus Christ is still more limited, in your opinion, than he was before he incarnated. Of course, that's part of the incarnation. That's part of the price he paid. He didn't have to. He chose to. But then, see, like I would bring in the return in me onto the glory we had together situation uh, and to prove they have the same kind of glory next to each other. I would bring that in and I would also bring this instance in. Jesus Christ on the cross, he said, it is finished. I mean, if the redemptive work is finished, basically what you're describing is the Son of God is still kind of limited where he's suffering and working out this redemptive yeah. sacrifice. Do you have any comment on that? Yeah, no, yeah. No, see, that's the problem. That actually dovetails into what I believe the Bible teaches. The reason why physical death occurs is because of sin. If he actually paid the price for sin, if he paid it, 
That means the curse that fell upon humanity has now been paid for. It's been removed. Therefore, if you have a Jesus who hasn't been raised as a man with a human nature and a physical body, that means he hasn't paid the price because the reason why Adam and Eve died physically is because of sin. So if you believe it is finished, I paid the price, the debt of sin has been removed, so that the curse of sin upon humanity has been removed, which is physical death. Well, what proof could Jesus give that now the payment has been accepted, the curse and judgment of sin has been removed, <clears throat> other than rising physically to show that debt that came upon us physically has been paid for. So in your view, you leave it where Jesus really didn't pay the price because physical death only entered the world because of sin. But you don't believe we're going to be physical bodies anymore. So then what way did he undo the curse and effect of sin? Because he became flesh and he gave his life as a ransom and then it was finished. To undo the effects of sin, right? To undo. To undo. pay the debt of sin, correct? Right. To but atone. hold on. The payment of sin is death, meaning I physically die because of sin. That's why I physically die. Well, God, here's the payment for this judgment. The judgment is removed. Well, if it's removed, that means physical death has been abolished. People will no longer physically die, but will be then resurrected in their physical bodies if the judgment and curse of sin has been removed, your theology has Jesus paying a debt without undoing the effects of that debt, which is physical death, because that's why we physically die, because of sin. So how do you get around that? I, I, I just feel like he died in the flesh, and then he was, he was raised up in the flesh, and when he ascended, he sat next to his father, and I don't think there's oxygen up there. I don't think blood is up there. But do you need oxygen for God to sustain a physical body in heaven? I don't believe. I don't believe so. I just believe. I, I just don't understand why Jesus Christ would have a physical body in heaven. I just and don't, uh, because I don't that's the it. price he paid to be in union with us, in solidarity with us, to be one of us, to sympathize with us, and the reason why he has a physical body as the proof, the effects of sin, the curse of sin, the judgment of sin, the consequence of sin has been paid. It's been removed, and here's the proof. I have now conquered death and have raised physically to undo the judgment of sin, which is physical death. So in my view, it makes sense. But you're telling me he only ra was raised in a physical body to give the appearance. OK, well, here I am in my body, but a body that he gets rid of. But for what reason? If the whole purpose of the incarnation is to be one of us, take on our nature to then glorify it, set it free from the effects of sin, Satan and death. And prove that he set it free from sin, sin, and death by then raising in that physical body, elevating the physical body, glorifying the physical body as a proof that we who believe in him, those bodies of ours that die will now be restored because the consequence of sin has been removed. So in my theology, it's consistent with scripture why we physically die, why Christ undid the death of sin upon physical humanity. And why he still has a physical body, but you're left with a Jesus who simply died in the flesh, appeared temporarily in the flesh, but got rid of the flesh. Then what was the point of even dying in the flesh and appearing in the flesh temporarily, if not to convince us, hey, sin brought physical death, done away with, no well, more physical death. The Bible says the purpose was for him to destroy the works of the devil. So he came down here. That's as one he, of them, right? It's one of them. Another one was to show us the one true God who we disagree on. But, well, in First uh, John 5.20, is that referring to the Father or the Son? Because that's I, what you're saying, right? I surely believe it's the him and the his. So. But who would that be? Well, we can talk about that some other time or a little later. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say, according to you, sin brought physical death. If Jesus said, it is finished, because I'm going back with what you're saying. It is finished. I've now paid the debt of sin. Right. What's the debt of sin? Physical death. Well, to show that God well, accepted you, what, that payment, that means the effects of sin have, uh, have to be undone. We, How is we, it undone think, if we're not going to be in physical bodies forever? I think, I think I'm having a hard time understanding that question you keep trying to ask me. And that's why I'm, okay. not, that's why I'm not answering it. Okay. It's not I, I, I'm going to break it down a little more? Yeah, I, I'm going to let you break it down a little more. It's not like I'm trying to avoid it. but I'm. No, just, I know, I know. I know you're not. You know what I mean? Okay, but, um, here's the thing. But, hold on, hold on. Go ahead, the, go, the, Gary, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. The redemptive, yeah, go ahead. the redemptive work, when when he says it is finished, in my opinion, he's saying my work that you sent me to do, my redemptive work is finished completely. 
And now God takes God the Father now takes total control over everything, raising him up. And yes, I know he said I'll raise myself up, but yeah, that okay. you know, that power according to scripture was given to him of his father. So yeah. I believe once he did that, everything he had to do when God, you know, sent him to be incarnate was done. But the way you teach, he's still now limited, like you say, in time and space in a flesh body. In an, imit in an immaterial world where there's no physical. Yeah, I don't believe it's immaterial. Yeah, but I mean... The I don't believe heaven is immaterial. You don't believe it's immaterial because you say God has a spiritual body. That's right, material right. of some kind. It's just not a, you know, it's not like the, the the world we live in. It's not a physical, like, stuff you could knock on. Like, you could... Yeah, but you do believe there are similarities between both dimensions, though there are differences. Because if you didn't believe that, it I goes do. back to the point I was making. I do. How then... How, so then you agree, because if it's not material of some kind, it's not the same substance of this earth, but it's still material of some kind that's close enough where angels can eat our food and we can eat their food. Right. No, so no, you can't no, tell me I, it's material. I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. So then if it is still a, a material dimension, but of a different sort, how do you know that that material dimension is a design – to allow physical bodies to dwell there. How would you know that? Because flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. We're not talking about the way Paul's you read it. In First Corinthians, it's not disagree. about corruptible flesh and blood, sinful flesh that dies. I'm not talking about that kind of body. Forget that body. A body of flesh that's sinless, perfect, cannot sin. How do you know that material, this material dimension we call heaven is not designed in such a way where such bodies can live there? I don't know that. I just, I have a hard time believing if we're all going to be changed and we're going to go from physical bodies and be as the angels, why, if we're going to be living in that realm, are, are all the angels going to be spirits and then we're going to be spirits and then Jesus is just going to be up there with a flesh body? The Father, like you said, God is still a spirit. So yeah. according to your belief, the only one in heaven that's in a flesh Sorry. body is Jesus Christ. Because he's the first fruits of the resurrection. I, he's the first fruits, and the rest will follow. So even though I die and my spirit goes to be with Jesus in heaven, I'm not going to remain a spirit with a spiritual form, what you call a spiritual body. Because the same Bible says in John 5, 20, 29, the hour is coming where those who are in their graves will come out when they hear the voice of the Son of God. And it talks about those who do good, the resurrection of life, and those who did evil to a judgment. What's coming out if it's not that physical body? Because in John 5, 20, 29, it's talking about the righteous and the wicked coming out of their graves. Right. What in There's the world two, is going to come out if it's not physical bodies? It's not physical. It's spiritual, incorruptible bodies. It's but you believe when you on, die, your body dies, your spirit leaves your body, right? I believe when I actually... Well, there's there's discussion about this, but I believe more in a soul sleep doctrine. Okay, all right. Well, what you know, you, even all right, what, even what? if you believe soul sleep, how can the wicked be raised in spiritual bodies when they're going to be sent off to torment? They're because it says be, the righteous and the wicked are coming out of the graves. There's a judgment for the sinners and a judgment for us. So what know? kind of bodies are the wicked are coming out of? Because it says from the graves. What's in the graves that are coming out? They're spiritual bodies. But that's not what was in the grave initially, right? Well, what was put in the grave their, wasn't a spiritual body. It's it's their spirit when they died. Their spirits in there, and then the spirit resurrects, and then God transforms that spirit into a spiritual body. Okay, so body I'm trying to understand your position because if you're in a grave from the dust returns to dust, and the spirit goes back to God who gives it, Ecclesiastes twelve seven. Right. The dust returns to the earth. Right. And the spirit goes back to God who gives it. How can a spirit still be in a tomb? Does that spirit disintegrate somehow? I mean, how is it I don't, in a tomb? I don't know. The, the, there's no Bible that would lead me to believe exactly where it goes. Do you Do you know any? any? No, I, well, I, I believe in the scriptures that our body returns dust, it disintegrates, but right. then God will reconstruct it, but our spirits don't remain there. This is where we probably have to do a discussion. Do we find plenty of evidence in the scriptures that people who die in Christ, their bodies return to dust and their spirits enter heaven? Yeah, Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. And Hebrews 12, 22 to 24, it says, You've come to Mount Zion, heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God, to myriads of angels, to the assembly and church of the firstborn, to the spirits 
of just men made perfect and to Jesus Christ and the sprinkled blood. So in, in heavenly Jerusalem at this time, he's saying God is there, the righteous judge, the myriads of angels are there, the assembly and the church of the firstborn are there, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and Jesus Christ is there. Now that makes sense. Their spirits are there, their bodies are not, because their bodies went to the dust. Right. But, so that's why so, we physics that, because our spirit leaves our bodies. Right, but do you, you don't believe the spirit is with God and like encased in that same area to be resurrected? Like you believe the spirit goes to heaven? Well, and as then, a believer, that's what Hebrews 12 said in heavenly Jerusalem. It says that, they're there in heavenly Jerusalem. So are we con do you believe that spirit's conscious with God while it's there? Yes. So yeah. then so then how then does it say that we're going to be the ground's going to open up and we're going to the dead are going to rise first? Is God going to yeah. send that is God going to send that yeah. spirit down? That's what 1 Thessalonians says. It says he will bring with Christ those who fall asleep. So what's coming with them? That's what 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, 18 says. But he the, will bring with Christ those who have fallen asleep. And come on. So what's coming on? What's coming with him? Oh, no. I believe when he's bringing that with Christ, that's already after that point. No, it says he's going to come. They're going to come with Christ, and then the dead will rise, and then we'll meet them in the air. They're coming with Christ, and then the dead will rise. So what's coming with Christ and what's coming up? The bodies come out, and their spirits come with Christ, just like Hebrews 12 said. The spirits are there. So you think flesh bodies are coming out of the ground? The bodies that were buried are now reconstructed, recreated to inhabit the spirits that left them. Because James 2.26 says, just as the body without the spirit is dead. So the spirit has to leave your body to die. But you're telling me, no, the spirit and the body are buried together. So this is where I'm getting confused. I'm it not, says physical death occurs when right. the spirit leaves the body. Right, right. I, I, don't, I don't believe like the spirit. Yeah, I, I think you got me on that one, man. Well, it's not to get you. It's just, I'm, you know, no, sharpener. No, no, no. I just want to know the truth on this because, honestly, with the soul sleep thing, yeah. I never understood it. Okay, don't believe I mean, it. I'm, I'm being honest. It's not scriptural. If you want to do a session, I'll go from Old Testament to New Testament and show you. But the Bible is clear. The reason why you physically is because your spirit leaves the body. James 2.26, just as the body without the spirit is dead. And when Jesus raised uh, Jairus' daughter, if you go to mm -hmm. Luke 8, and you read 54 to 55. It says, when he touched her hand, he said, little damsel rise. It says, her spirit entered, returned to her body. Mm -hmm. That's Luke 8, 55. If you want me to read it, or you can look no, at it. No, no, I'm there. hearing you. I think, I think I'm going to just dump the soul sleep doctrine. So then if we dump I'm the soul sleep doctrine, go ahead, I'm sorry. I think, I think you've convinced me to dump that, to be well, honest. Praise Jesus. You. Everything good and true from him, everything yeah. mistaken from me may save us from error. For the glory of Christ, because you're a brother here. I'm not here to beat you down. I just want to see yeah, where I'm you not, show me my error, and I show you what the Scripture teaches. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm still not with you on Jesus having flesh, but All right, that's I'm, definitely, I mean, I'm definitely closer to thinking it's a possibility. All right. Well, hey, listen, I, got, I, just, I, 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 I just think, do you have problems with this doctrine with people? Like, no. are pe like, I mean, people, I have doctrines of everything. No, no. I mean, problems but, with everything, with any, every doctrine. No, but every doctrine. Jesus having uh, the physical body. This is not something that's really hard for people to swallow. Like, well, I mean, because, if a person because you're saying yeah. one third of God, right? One third of God. I don't break God into parts, so I, I don't say I one third All of right. anything. All right, so one person of God. Let me use the Trinity yeah, language, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. One person of God is human. Yes, because he became flesh. Yes, well, I mean, I mean, it, it, here, even if you put the Trinity aside for a, for a moment, you also believe at some point in time, this secondary God, who's not the Most High Jehovah, became human. Even your position is a hard pill to swallow but for it's anyone. Not, but it's not the Most High becoming human for me. Regardless if it's not the Most High, if still you're saying... Here's someone that comes out of God. God birthed them, brought him forth from his own essence, like Eve came out of Adam to become a separate conscious being. And he is a God because God has conferred upon him all his authority and his SNH, but he's still a God. And this mm -hmm. God became human and died. Believe me when I tell you, any of the monotheistic religions like Judaism and Islam will have a hard time with that as well. Oh, I know, I know. It, it's like I said in our in our last debate, right? And this wasn't even a debate because no, it's a discussion. This 
you know, this was not something I was uh, locked into, none of this. And this doesn't affect my view of, of the other thing with God. Would you agree? Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. This my is point a totally, is, this is, a to, this is a totally off issue, right? All I can tell you, it was God, God's will you and me meet because I had not known. I want people to know this. I didn't know that Anthony Rogers and David Wood mentioned me debating you. God is my witness. I hadn't watched that video. When I saw this other video, something in my heart said, reach out to this guy and engage him in a debate. God wanted us to meet. Right. I believe I'm that. Coming. Yeah, I've, because I know the Lord is, wants to use you in my life and me in your life. That's how it works. Right. And I, and I, and you know, honestly, it's been a long time since somebody's got me to change my view on something. And I think I'm dumping that. I know this just a stupid doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> that that yeah. soul sleep is such an off doctrine. But like, yeah, yeah. I would oh, yeah, read, yeah. I would read the Bible, and I'm gonna look into what you said about how they the the spirits come in with the saints, yeah. and how then. So you believe the body comes up out of the ground, the physical yeah. body. And then Jesus Christ is coming back with the spirit, and then that spirit's going to go in there and amalgamize. And yeah, and then their bodies become glor glorious, transformed, immortal. No more pain, no more sin, no more corruption. That's what is here. Let me read for Thessalonians well, wait, for you. Wait, that, go ahead. That's, but that's another problem. This, this brings up another problem I had, and this is why I, I was starting to lean soul sleep. Because yeah. it says at that moment, that's when there's going to be no more tears, so... That's that's kind of doesn't work because if the spirit goes to be in heaven with the Lord and then yeah. he's coming back with it, are you saying there's still tears uh, in in the in between time? You know what I'm well, saying? Let me, let, well, let me read Revelation because you're quoting Revelation, right? To answer your question, let the scriptures answer this. This probably will entail another discussion about whether people in heaven can know things on earth. Not everything, but are they aware of certain things? Well, here, Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Watch here. Let me show you this. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, right, the, the souls, souls, notice, not bodies, mm -hmm. of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testament in which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So that same revelation that says all tears will be wiped away is the same revelation that tells me those who are martyred for Christ, their souls are under the altar in heaven because that shows there were a sacrifice. By dying as martyrs, they gave themselves as sacrifices to God, which is why they're by the altar. And they're conversing with God consciously and telling God how much longer. So they're still aware of what happened on earth. And Jesus still makes it, makes it known to them, more will die. More are going to be killed. Just wait. So I don't see a problem with either position because though they're, they're in heaven and they have robes and they're not physically suffering, they still know the plight of their brothers on earth that they're suffering because Jesus just told them. Here, let me read it again. Verse 11. Mm -hmm. And white robes were given unto every one of them and was said unto them. So they're told. That they should rest yet for a while until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed. So they're mm -hmm. told, more are going to die like you. You think they're really completely at rest knowing that more Christians will be killed? But here's where they rejoice. Though they're killed, they're going to be with us, live with us, and we will be victorious at the end. So where's the problem? I don't have one anymore. I think. So you're saying those those saints were the ones that were slain before he even came coming, you know, back in the clouds. Well, that's what he says right here. And it then, says, and then the wait. ones, the the yeah. ones that are that they're saying are going to be slain in the future. The like the right at the end, right there. Is that yeah, because it says, "You wait a while, I will avenge you." Because it says, "How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth?" It's not yet. Wait. Here's your white robes. You rest. I'm going to take care of business. Just wait, because there are more Christians who need to be killed before I pour out my wrath upon the inhabitants of the earth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've so been. You tell me. I've been questioning that soul sleep doctrine for a long time, and my wife, she just hates that I believe it because she wants to go straight to be with the well, Lord. Well, I'm not trying to tickle ears, but that's what the Bible teaches. 
there, this soul sleep doctrine, and I can put more holes in it from the Old Testament. Here, I'll give you another example. I know we went off topic, but this is important. Here, I want you to pay attention carefully to the language of God to Abraham. This is Genesis 15, 15. Now, before I even read Genesis 15, 15, you and I both know Abraham was from Ur of Chaldee. So his ancestors, his fathers died there, and his father died in, in Haran, right? He wasn't in Canaan, right? Mm -hmm. And then, remember, because you got to remember this. Then when Sarah died, Abraham purchased the cave of Machpelah. In, and this is, you'll read this in Genesis 23. A cave in Machpelah. He bought it, buried Sarah there. So Sarah's the only one buried there, right? right. And he came from Ur of Chaldees, that's Genesis 11, if you read 22 to 32. Went to Haran with his father Terah. His father died there, and he went there with his nephew Lot, their wives, their servants, to Canaan. So all of Abraham's ancestors, his father, his grandfather, his grand grandfather, they were not in Canaan. They were buried in Ur of Chaldee, and his father was buried in Haran. The reason why I'm emphasizing this is because I want you to see what God says to Abraham. Watch this. Genesis 15, 15. Mm -hmm. God speaking to Abraham, and he says, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. You will not see this promise of your descendants inheriting Canaan, because you will go to your fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Can I ask you a question? What's that? God says, when you die, Abraham, you're going to go to your fathers in peace. How did he go to his fathers in peace? He wasn't buried with them. Because if you go to Genesis 25, don't let me read you, 25. Don't go you ahead. believe they remained in Abraham's bosom until captivity? Ah, uh, so you answered the question. Here's the Old Testament. God is saying, Abraham, when you die, you'll be gathered to your fathers in peace, and then you'll be buried at an old age. But wait, none of his fathers were buried in the cave of Machpelah. Only Sarah was. How was he gathered to them? In the netherworld. But then notice what he says. You're going to go there in peace. Implication? Not everyone there is in a state of peace, but you will be. Mm -hmm. Right. You catch it? Right. Which would line up with the with the with the great expanse in between, right? You got it. So Luke yeah. 16 is simply a confirmation by Jesus of what the Old Testament saints already knew. When we die, we're all going to be gathered in this nether world, some of us in peace, others in torment. Because now let me read Genesis 25, verses 8 to 9 for you. Watch what he gives up. Why does death occur? Genesis 25, verses 8 to 9. Then Abraham gave up the ghost mm -hmm. and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Notice he's gathered to his people when he died, but then he's buried. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar, the Hittite, which is before memory. Okay, now I'm confused. It says when he died and his ghost left, that's when he was gathered to his people. But then later they came and buried his body in Machpelah. So what went to his people when he died and what was being buried in the cave? The spirit went with the others and the, the physical body went in the cave. There you go. So, so this soul so, sleep doctrine is not biblical. Right. Well, I was breaking it off. I was segregating the Old Testament. See, I believe like you do right there. But after Jesus Christ went down to the belly, belly of the earth and took captivity captive, I, you was, got it. I was sticking with the other other view because I just felt things changed after that. Now everyone's staying in the ground so they could be resurrected. You understand no, what I yeah, mean? No, no. What it is is their bodies is coming out being recreated, but their souls either go to be the Lord or they go to the place of torment. Exactly. That's biblical. Right. And I'm willing to go, I'm I'm willing to jump off that doctrine. I'm glad we had this conversation because I've always been willing to. And I enjoy talking with you because I love you and I respect you and I enjoy your questions. I really mean that. Okay. I, I hope I'm giving you good enough questions to let no, you... No, you're excellent. Actually, I need this. I need more of this because it keeps me focused and sharp and go back to my scriptures to make sure by the power of the Holy Spirit I'm understanding them and hopefully by the power of the Spirit living out for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, it was good to have you. I know this is yeah. going to bless people. people yeah, man. Let me on it so download it so I can link to your page, and then I'm going to get my guy to post it on my YouTube page, yeah. I promise. This is proof, and let everyone know it, who says I never will listen to anybody. See, if somebody actually has a good point, I will change. Praise God. I will yeah. change. And right? that's why I love you, man. You know? Pray I can have that humble spirit, too. I love you, man. All right. Be blessed. Love you. Jesus bless you, brother. Take care. Bye-bye.